Nebula was loser otaku who spent his life gaming till he got reincarnated as a god that can evolve any species into legendary beings if they have faith in him. It all started with the final battle in Perished World between the two top players, Nebula and Hegemonia. Both sides had impressive forces, with Nebula's forces relying on guns and cannons, and Hegemonia's side relying on magic and sorcery. Both sides were ready to die for the god they served, and this resulted in a battle for the ages. For the players, it was almost like playing a game of chess, with one trying to outsmart the other. Hegemonian have seemed to have the upper hand, so Nebula authorized a nuclear strike to even the odds. Hegemonia had anticipated the attack and ordered his own anti-ballistic missiles, which took out most of the ballistic ones, causing a huge explosion in the sky. However, one missile still managed to escape. The warhead headed right for the enemy base, so Hegemonia's priest led his people to pray and their prayer materialized a holy orb being that was able to stop the warhead with one hand. Hegemonia gloated over his brilliant plan, thinking this was finally the end but Nebula had one final trick up his sleeve, a kinetic attack. His satellite in space immediately released tungsten rods which caught Hegemonia off guard. He ordered the Orc Lord to stop the impending disaster, but Nebula knew the energy racked up from the fall would be too great to stop. The rods broke through the spirit orc and blew up the palace below, taking out countless orcs, including their beloved priest. After the devastation, all the faith Hegemonia worked so hard to build, disappeared in an instant, which also meant that his spirit apostle was toast as well. The game ended in Nebula's favor, but Hegemonia was desperate for one more match. However, after seeing what Hegemonia brought to the table, Nebula wasn't impressed and decided to move on. Nebula had ranked first for the last two months and had completed all his achievements. He was hoping to get some rest when a message popped up on the screen. The game informed him that this version of the game was only a bit of testing period, and the real game would soon be released to the world, so Nebula has the special perk of playing it before it goes live. Excited for a new challenge, Nebula was definitely down for the opportunity, so when the game asked if he wished to enter, he clicked yes. Suddenly, the game sucked him in and before he knew it, he was standing in some space ruins in the body of his in-game avatar. He was taking this Jumanji ripoff nightmare quite well when a mysterious hooded figure told him he was one of the chosen ones. Nebula noticed some creepy shadows in the distance and asked what the f those were about so the woman explained that in case any of the players knew each other, they all received a mask to keep the game fair. She then suggests they get to the point and shows them a planet that looks vaguely like Earth. But after seeing that image too many times, Nebula can tell that it's perished world. Suddenly, the woman announces that in a few moments, they will all become true gods of the perished world. There's tension in the air, and though Nebula can't hear it, he's sure the other players are pissing themselves. Apparently, perished world wasn't just a world that existed in a game. It was a real world that had been abandoned by its gods for some mysterious reason. It used to be a glorious civilization, where various races lived in harmony, but for some unknown reason, all the gods vanished. The game was then created to discover suitable god candidates for the planet, and now these anti-social negative rise losers have the chance of becoming true gods. Just like in the game, the goal is to start out by getting lowly beings to believe in you. But if you can get enough of a following, you'll become the sole god of this world and do anything you want. Nebula asks what would happen if they give up, so she explains that they would simply return to their normal brain rot lives and lose all memories of this place. However, they won't be able to give up once they start their challenge. Nebula then asks the question on everyone's minds. What happens if you get defeated by another god? The room tenses up as she announces that if they die as a god, they'll meet their true end. Nebula figures that dying as a god is better than dying as a virgin of Taku who shrivels up in the sun, so there's no reason to back down. The moment comes for them to decide whether they give up, while those who choose to stay will start by pulling a small region to conquer. Like clockwork, the smart players start pulling out. Knowing this YOLO leveling is about to be a bad idea. The players were about 32 to start with, but now five people have called it quits, meaning a total of 27 people decided they could only bag some if they were god. For the remaining players, they're asked to randomly pick a region, starting with Nebula since he's the highest ranking of all. He pulls a card and his last word is before he disappears into the game. Inside Perished World, some talking froggies go fishing for dinner when they spot a strange new butterfly species. The butterfly flies back to the dimension with Nebula as he looks over his current options. Turns out the region he pulled is the one with insects, 
notorious for the lowest win rate. But that's not the worst part. He's starting so far east on the continent that he won't get much combat experience early on. Well, given the hand he's been dealt, an insect-eating race like the Frogman would be a good place to start. However, the size of the race is too many to use as a starting race. In the game, you can only influence creatures once you gain their faith and his faith points are way too low for these peppy cousins. The next best species seems to be the Lizardman, who can survive on insects without water. Their numbers are fewer, and they've got some old, sickly, and wounded ones too. From the looks of it, they've just been expelled from their lands, which means they probably feel abandoned by the world. Just one miracle is all it could take to become their god, so Nebula decides to start with the most pathetic-looking one of all Raycrack. Meanwhile, the lizard group continues to roam the desert starving, when one of them spots an injured gazelle which means dinner. They immediately jump it and start feasting while the old sick and injured wait for what's left. In mere minutes, all that's left of the gazelle is a pile of bones that can still be squeezed for some bone marrow, so they manage to leave those for the old and sick who chew on those bones like it's the last meal they'll ever see. The rest of the group wonders if that was a good idea since that lot will still die no matter what they do, especially Raycrack, who should be long gone by now. Jaw reminds them that Raycrack got wounded while protecting the rest of them from a saber-toothed tiger, so they should all be grateful to him but they still maintain that he's dead weight. Later that night, the lizards cuddle up in groups and pairs while Raycrack shivers alone till a mysterious butterfly wakes him up. He decides to follow after it, and while he does, some of the other lizardmen see him and assume he's going off to an early death and almost celebrate. Raycrack himself thinks he might be hallucinating his way to the pearly gates when he discovers something impossible, a mountain of beetles that can feed the whole group. With this, Nebula receives a notification that the pack has finally found a revelation. As they sit to gobble down the beetles, Nebula plans what to do next when he notices Raycrack sharing the revelation with the others already. Soon after, Nebula receives another notification that the lizardmen have recognized him as the nameless beetle god. Aside the horrible-sounding name, Nebula looks at the pack happily as he selects Raycrack to be an important piece for him, though he intends to return the favor. Some days later, Raycrack searches for the side of the beetles, wondering if he's hallucinating for real this time. The lizardmen assume they'll be eating good tonight thanks to Raycrack, but Raycrack is worried that his visions keep leading him toward the colder regions. Raycrack says they'll die if they keep going in that direction, but at the same time, there's absolutely nothing in the direction they're coming from. Raycrack starts to question what his visions really mean, but his only choice is to trust them. Nebula is still restricted in his medium of reaching out to his new servant, so he's relying solely on Raycrack to discover the unimaginable future that awaits them. Just then Lizardmen stumble on a beautiful oasis and Raycrack announces to the rest of the group that the nameless beetle god has led them there. The lizards can't believe their eyes, but when it sinks in, they start to celebrate and thank Raycrack for saving them even though they were totally going to let him die. Nebula's god level increases to level 2, and he unlocks a new skill called Insect Stankification. Nebula officially chooses Raycrack to be his priest and bestows his will on the rest of his people. To help, Nebula gives Raycrack a blessing and a blue light wraps around Raycrack's body. That night, the lizards are fast asleep when a firefly flies toward Raycrack and a faint voice calls out for him. Suddenly, Raycrack finds himself on his knees in a white void full of insects. He hears his name once again and calls out to ask who this god is. Then he sees a hooded lizard-like man standing in front of him and holding out his hand. Raycrack struggles to figure out what he's trying to tell him when a buffalo skull suddenly appears in his hands. He stares at it and when he looks up, he sees Nebula in his true form and realizes it's the nameless beetle god. The next morning, Raycrack gathers all his people and tells them what happened in his dream. The people immediately start asking questions and pointing out that to sacrifice a buffalo, they'd need to head deep into the wilderness, which is too risky. The lizards argue among themselves on what to do but one of them makes a valid point that it would take a lot of their hunters to take one down, meaning no one would be left to protect the weak. Raycrack admits that the lizard is right, and they can't afford to risk the group, so he offers to go alone, shocking the others. They insist that he's as good as dead if he tries it, but Raycrack tells them not to worry and reveals that God has given him a blessing. He explains that when he woke up, his wounds had all been healed and covered in black scales like a beetle. The lizards admit that it's hard to ignore, but it's still not enough reason to go buffalo hunting alone. With no other choice, Raycrack decides to show them what he's packing. 
He squeezes his muscles and throws his spear toward an innocent tree, which gets obliterated in an instant, while their puny lizard's brains begin to explode. Raycrack goes to retrieve his spear, while the rest of the group runs toward him to ask if he's been hiding this power all along. It's almost unbelievable that the lizard Jigachad, standing before them, was the same wounded weakling scheduled for an impending funeral. Suddenly, the group hears a rumbling sound getting closer and Raycrack gets excited as he points them in the direction of where it's coming from, and it turns out to be a herd of buffalo. It doesn't make sense that the buffalo would suddenly appear in this location, but Raycrack calls them pointless worries as he holds his spear up. Next, he leaps off the cliff and announces that today is the day they get set free from hunger as he hurls his spear toward the herd and hits one right in the middle of its head. Chaos breaks out among the buffalo, so the rest of the hunters grab spares to join him. That night, the group arranges an altar from the buffalo bones and ties the first kill on top of it. Raycrack takes the lead and kneels before the altar while the rest of the group stands behind him. Raycrack calls to the almighty beetle god to accept their offering and though the others are hesitant at first, they join him in the prayer. Nebula watches them and thinks it's a pretty sloppy attempt, but it's the thought that counts this time. With this act alone, Nebula racks up way more faith points than expected, and Nebula commends Raycrack on trying his best as a novice priest. However, he can't materialize water or grass for the buffalo to feed, so he makes use of locusts to supply them with some grass. Nebula realizes that the lizardmen are only consuming, and though he doesn't expect cattle-raising knowledge from them at this stage, the oasis isn't enough to support their population for long. Without farming knowledge, the lizards would be back to being dessert ornaments in a few years. Nebula wonders how he can teach them these skills without interfering directly, and realizes it will take him some time but in the meantime, he decides to give his servants a small blessing and accept their wonky altar. Some weeks later, Raycrack goes to observe the altar because of a disturbing dream he had, Joel asks if it was another vision, but Raycrack's not sure since it was too vague. In his dream, he saw the altar trembling violently as it rested on the blessing that had protected them for years. There were no more fishes and the land was no longer producing plants. Joel assures him there's nothing to worry about since their holy sugar daddy is looking out for them. However, Raycrack climbs up the altar and warns that if they're unable to understand the meaning behind God's messages, they'll end up going against his will. Suddenly. Raycrack spots something in the distance and tells Joel to climb up quickly. When he does, Raycrack points out an approaching enemy group and realizes why the altar was shaking in his dream. Those fat blue bats are here to drive them out again. They recognize the approaching herd of blue skin, big bodies, and tamed monsters. They were the ones who drove them out of their old home, which has probably been devastated if they're now wandering the desert. Joel worries that the blue leather tribe is probably looking for a new place. But Raycrack points out that they're probably just going in random directions, since they can't see the oasis from that far out. They'd likely just pass by without noticing. Suddenly, a dumb lizard called Yuri announces that the oasis is a sanctuary of the nameless beetle god, and the blue leather tribe isn't allowed in. The blue baldies look up and spot the lizard, while Raycrack and Jal sigh exhaustively when they realize they left that patrol. However, Raycrack realizes that this may be a sign from their god and begins to climb down the altar. Joel asks if God wants them to provoke a fight, but Raycrick explains that it's a mission to make peace with their enemies and save them. Joel wonders why their God would drive a rival group towards sharing their land, but Raycrick sees the glowing butterfly once more and is convinced it is the will of the beetle God. Determined to carry out his assignment, Raycrack walks through the others toward the approaching menace. Nebula is surprised that Raycrack understood what he wanted so quickly. His plan is for the two tribes to merge so their population can grow and their technology can advance. Nebula is impressed that Raycrack made the decision on his own, so he has to give it to the lizard for having bits of steel. This is an excellent development as Nebula will need a strong-willed leader so he won't need to control every little thing anymore. Back at the oasis, the fat lizard calls out to Yuri and asks if they all live there and the idiots are quick to tell him that it's their land. The blue chief gets more crafty and asks what could possibly be there, expecting them to spill the beans but to his surprise. Raycrack walks up behind him and tells him they have trees, shrubs, a good life and their god. When Raycrack starts spouting nonsense about some beetle god, the fat leader assumes he's a barbarian and orders them to leave the area, promising not to attack if they comply. He warns them that they're severely outnumbered 
and can't beat them in a fight but Raycrack remains unfazed and invites them to join the fold as their god wills. The mutant lizard starts to laugh as he mocks Raycrack for not being able to do the math. However, Raycrack holds out his spare against him, causing the reptile to attack. As the blue one charges forward, Raycrack prays to his god for strength against his enemies, but when the beast attacks, he instantly destroys Raycrack's spear, shocking him. The blue bastard laughs and calls him a fool for opposing him, and the monster reaches out to attack again. At that moment, Nebula receives a notification on the clash of two civilizations, meaning both sides can receive a boost in experience. Nebula chooses the obvious tribe and unlocks new skills for them to try. Just as the monster is about to rip Raycrack to pieces, a bright light descends from the heavens toward him. The fat one laughs to himself, thinking that Raycrack's been defeated till they realized he sped away in an instant and is now overflowing with an intense blue aura. Nebula possesses Raycrack's body, so when the blue chief charges toward him, he activates his foresight ability. This allows him to see the abilities of the blue chief, which really are nothing special compared to Raycrack. However, in combination with the monster's abilities, even Raycrack won't be able to handle them. Thankfully, Raycrack receives an upgrade in a title called Divinity, speeds toward the monster and grabs it. With this upgrade, Raycrack's strength is now up to 630 so with one hand. Raycrack lifts the monster and smashes it on its back as everyone watches in disbelief. It's no surprise that the unbelievable difference in power would leave the lizard brains mind blown. With the beast out cold, the lizardmen hail Raycrack for doing an amazing job but Raycrack looks back at them with an intense stare that makes them wonder if it's really him. The blue chief refuses to give up and reaches for his weapon to attack insisting that he's never lost a fight. But with one swing of his claw, Raycrack takes out the Blue Chief and asks who's next. The rest of the Leather Tribe drop their weapons and surrender to Raycrack immediately. So the Blue Aura begins to fade and Raycrack comes back to himself. Raycrack can't believe it's already over and wonders if God possessed his body as it all felt like a dream. That night, the Blue Leather Tribe joins them for dinner, and they're shocked to learn that they were the same measly tribe they drove out into the desert. Even though their scales had discolored that much, they somehow became strong by following the nameless beetle god. The blue leather lizards start to consider this nameless god they speak of and think of how great he must be to give a lizard man that kind of power. Meanwhile, Jol asks Raycrack if they'll really be okay after experiencing a 600% increase in their population. There's no way the oasis can sustain them. Raycrack thinks hard about it and suggests they leave the oasis. But Joel points out that they can't just wander about to nowhere. Raycrack says that the answer must be with the Leather Tribe, which is why God must have wanted them to merge. The next day, Yuri and his men watch over Manon, but it attacks them and wars loudly, threatening to break free from its restraints. Yuri tries to talk some sense into the creature when Raycrack walks up behind him and offers to take it from there. Manon instantly recognizes Raycrack as the one responsible for his new back pain and quiets down but Raycrack simply walks up to him and hands him some food. Manon's hesitant but also starving so he creeps slowly, takes a little bite, and then starts to munch freely while the others are stunned that the beast could be tamed so easily. Raycrack holds it fondly and asks if it wants more while the creature grows fond of him. Raycrack gives him more food to eat which Manon gobbles down quickly, and while Raycrack watches, he thinks there must be a reason God kept the beast alive. Manon looks up to Raycrack for more food but Raycrack tells him that he's got to learn to be patient from now on. Manon looks sad but understands as he lays down calmly. Raycrack tells the boys to let him know if Manon troubles them again and walks off like a boss. Later, Raycrack and Jol meet with one of the men from the Leather Tribe who made their iron weapons. The man explains that if their leader wasn't so stingy with resources, he could have made way better ones. Jol asks what the problem was, and the man explains that there was no wood available so Raycrack says they have some to spare. Raycrack asks how they didn't use their wood for campfires, and the man explains that they used to make a special fuel. So Lacrip dismisses him and says he'll think about everything and let him know the next day. Next up is a one-armed lizard man called Stargazer. He heard they were looking for a guide so Raycrack guesses the man must be a wanderer, and the old lizard laughs and says he does enjoy going from place to place and now he has learned to see pathways. Stargazer says he can help them find lands where they won't be hungry close by, but he's unsure if they're still uninhabited. Raycrack declares that if the races there are hostile, they'll simply defeat them and take the lands for themselves. Stargazer says he trusts his intentions but wonders if Raycrack 
would be able to do the same and trust in his abilities. He then points to the sky and says his answers are up there, past the skies. He follows the stars and uses their movements to form pathways. Raycrack isn't sure what to make of this, so Stargazer offers to show him the paths the stars will follow over the next few days and if he's able to prove it. Redcrack has to trust him in return. Raycrack agrees, and the lizards spend the next few minutes stargazing and discussing till the old lizard says they'll meet again the same time the next day. Later, Lacroix finds Yuri using his last standing brain cell and asks him if Manon is misbehaving again. Yuri says he's been as docile as a dog if they bring his food on time, so something else is troubling him. You see, Yuri finally accessed enough brain cells to have a brilliant idea. After watching Raycrack tame Manon, he realized they could tame another species. He then points at the buffaloes and suggests they tame them for travel so they don't starve. At that moment, a notification pops up, announcing that the tribe has unlocked livestock farming. Human history is said to have diverged into two streams, agriculture and livestock farming. Objectively, agriculture is more stable than most civilizations were built on it, but for nebulas lizardmen with strong physiques and high environmental adaptability, livestock farming is the better fit. They'd also need technological advancement, like iron and thanks to the leather tribe's blacksmith. They're one step closer to getting some. After several hours of work, the blacksmith makes some iron spearheads. Though they're still more primitive than bronze, it's a huge step up from using stone. Now, the most surprising development of all is astronomy, thanks to Stargazer's additions. He and Rikrik still spent every night staring at the stars and learning. It might not be full-fledged astronomy, but hopefully, Stargazer will further his knowledge in the future. Back at the oasis, Rikrik stares at the stars alone this night and finally concludes that Stargazer knows his onions, so he's now got a big decision to make. Later, Rikrek gathers everyone in front of the altar and reminds them of how far they've come. They found the oasis, and they found their old brothers. Even though they could have abandoned them to die in the desert, that wasn't God's will. He wanted them to grow in numbers for a reason. So once morning comes the next day, they'll have to leave the oasis. The people gossip in the background as Rikrek calls up Stargazer, and confirms that all his sky babblings are legend, so he names him the official guide for the tribe. Raycrack tells Stargazer to tell the tribe where he'll be leading them, so he explains that when the sun rises, they'll head southward. They'll have to spend a ton of days walking, but after the cuss-inducing blisters, they'll reach a large forest with many wild beasts and several species. Raycrack explains that it'll be a good place to live and thanks Stargaze for his input as he returns to his place. Next, Raycrack stands tall and calls up Yuri who wonders what he's screwed up this time. Raycrack asks him to tell the tribe why he and his men didn't eat the buffalo they hunted the day before so. Yuri figured that if they abstained now, they could eat the buffalo later when they were truly starving. Raycrack commends him for really glowing up in sense and restraining himself for the good of the tribe. For this, he brings out a reward, a spear made out of iron, and hands it to Yuri. And for the other lizardmen who held back their appetites, he handed them their very own iron spears. The rest of the tribe marvels at the buff-looking lizardmen, wanting to get their own iron spears someday, while Joel finally understands what Raycrack has been planning for them all this time. After, Raycrack grabs one of the buffalo skulls and tells the men to stand in front of him one by one. Raycrack puts on one of the skulls and reminds them that they have a long journey ahead, but with spirit, patience, and mostly God, they can make it. That's why he hands Yuri a skull and dubs him a skeleton warrior. Yuri almost cries from the honor, and soon enough the rest of his men receive buffalo skulls and become skeleton warriors too. Raycrack continues to charge the tribe up with his words and tells them to trust the nameless beetle god and march forward. They'll have to endure the trying times for a better future. The lizardmen cheer in unison as they get ready to move out. Raycrack takes a deep sigh and hopes that the nameless beetle god will forgive him for calling his own plans God's will. However, as Nebula watches, he decides there's no need for Raycrack to apologize because if he didn't support his actions, he wouldn't have chosen him as his priest. But even more than that, Raycrack has managed to cause the other lizardmen's levels to increase in trust and warrior abilities. And Raycrack himself has leveled up significantly, so he hasn't disappointed Nebula at all. But from here on out, the real game begins. Some days later, as the lizardmen walk through the trenches, Manon begins to see stars and collapses. Raycrack realizes he must not be used to living with scarce resources, and suggests that the tribe take a break for now. 
Everyone's relieved cause they really need one while Raycrack wonders if they can really survive the torture. It's only been three days and the whole group is tired and running out of food but Raycrack can't rely on God to bail them out this time. Suddenly, one of his men comes running up with news that a new species has arrived. Up ahead, a tribe of orcs spots the lizardmen and plans to take them as food. Thinking that facing them would be better than facing the monster they're running from. They run toward the group, but when they see how fearless and unbothered they are, they start to feel intimidated and rethink their choices. The orcs do a double take between the skull warriors and their sorry excuse for weapons, and they immediately drop the toys and apologize for the brain fart. Afterward, the lizardmen give them food to eat and the orc thank them and explain that they were desperately trying to escape the canyon. Raycrack's surprised to hear this, so the orc chief explains that they had to abandon their home, pack as much food as possible, and head into the wilderness. He points them toward the hills they used to live in which had enough for them to live off until a terrifying monster appeared. As Nebula watches the events unfold, he figures that he knows exactly what this monster is. It's one of the abominations called the Ancient Coleoptera. In the storyline of the Perished World game, the old gods had created powerful creatures, but after the old gods vanished, these creatures were led to their own devices and became what the players called abominations. The orcs led the lizardmen to see what they were dealing with, and it was truly an abomination to behold. The massive centipede-like monster also had some strange devices strapped to its body as it moved around. Nebula takes a look at its stats and concludes that it's definitely too strong for the lizardmen to defeat but watches their conversation unfold. As the lizardmen watch, the ground begins to rumble and the orcs explain that the creature's still sleeping. Yuri asks why they aren't running away with their arms flailing in the air, yet so Raycrack asks Stargazer how long it would take to go around the canyon. Stargazer says they'd have to head back into the wilderness, and it could take an extra eight days. Nebula watches as Raycrack hesitates, which is fair since his people are so scared and not exactly in a position to fight. However, making the journey back isn't a viable option either if they don't want to starve to death, so he's curious to see what move Raycrack will make. Jal joins Raycrack to think of what to do when she notices a couple of boulders nearby, so she approaches Raycrack and tells him they must fight causing her to level up as a mediator. She explains that they currently have the advantage but Raycrack doesn't know what she means. She reminds him of the process the blacksmith followed in their work and how he used a special tool to make his work more efficient. With that tool, he was able to get the same result while reducing his effort. Raycrack's starting to see the bigger picture as Joel adds that in their case, they don't won't need something so complicated and only need to apply the same concept. A while later, the lizardmen have already arranged lever systems to push the boulders onto the giant centipede monster. Under Raycrack's orders, they try to time their efforts to move the stones forward. Nebula continues to observe, commending their simple yet efficient idea. However, he notes that to take down a monster of that caliber, they'll need to drop the boulders at the same time to stand a chance. The moment of truth comes, and the boulders roll off the cliff toward the creature and smash into it head-on. The lizardmen wonder if they've actually done it. But Nebula knows better. The creature comes crawling up from under the rubble mat as and starts crawling up the walls to eat an early dinner. When the lizardmen see this, they rush to push the other rocks down the cliff, but Nebula knows it's too late for that, and he'll have to intervene. Once again, he uses his god's descent ability and possesses Raycrack's body, so that he single-handedly pushes the rocks off with the levers. For the last one, he uses his bare hands and summons unbelievable strength to push it off the cliff. The boulders head straight for the creature, but Nebula figures they might still not be enough to take it down, so he grabs his spear, leaps off the cliff, and throws the spear with all the power in his body. The spear flies past the boulders, past the creature's head, and takes out the large structure on its back, causing it to scream out in pain, and while it's still reeling the boulders smash into its head and crush its body for good this time. Nebula sticks the landing and once he's sure the creature is out for the count, he returns to his dimension and calls it a successful hunt. A notification pops up, announcing his new achievement of defeating an abomination, while the lizardmen cheer proudly and Nebula's faith points rise. But more importantly, he received a new item, which was the real reason he wanted the creature dead. In his hands, he now holds a red glowing orb known as Abomination Essence. Now, each god can create resources specific to their species, which is typically done by spending faith points. However, to create a being that doesn't exist in this world already, they'd need special resources like this. With this essence, 
Nebula can create a sacred beast that can spread the word of its god in this world's domain and also grow stats. And if they level up enough, they can even become Apostle class. Nebula wonders if the creation systems still work the same way as the game and wonders what he'll be able to create. Meanwhile, the lizardmen head down to inspect the creature and Joel wonders if they can use it as food. She takes a bite out of it and tastes just as bad as it smells, like She thinks hard and wonders what they can do to make it more edible and figures that it might not be so bad with other ingredients. She notices spices that can mask the stench and plans to burn it over a fire. After testing her experiment, she tries the centipede again and she's pleasantly surprised. She goes straight to Raycrack and offers him some, explaining that though it's pretty bland, it's now edible thanks to what she calls cooking. After she explains the process to Raycrack, he asks her to teach him the skill, and she gladly agrees. As they eat, Joel points out that the chief of the orcs has an hair, so it would be wise for Raycrack to find a mate too. Raycrack didn't know what that feeling was, but his BP just shot up as her words caught him off guard. She continues by reminding him they're getting old, and it would be crucial to stabilize the lounge. Rickrack thinks long and hard about the idea, and when Jaws sees that the hopeless fool might die thinking, she suggests herself since he doesn't have enough rizzing skills. Suddenly, Rickrack looks up and sees something glowing behind Jaw, a convenient escape from that conversation. Actually, it's a gold tablet that seems to have fallen out of the structure that was attached to the creature. Yuri's first instinct is to try and eat the thing, but Stargazer tells him it's a metal called gold. Jal recalls seeing it before with the blacksmith, who explained that it never changes color or decays, so humans think it's worth a lot. Yuri wonders what good it is if it doesn't end up in his belly, so wise old Stargazer tells the Methed to try catching some deer in the area nearby. It works like a charm and he's able to get rid of the lizard-sized nuisance, while the grown-ups look the tablet over. Raycrack realizes that from Jaws's description, the tablet is basically eternal, so later that day, he thinks some more about it. If everything else dies and decays but the tablet doesn't, there must be some reason why the people who created it wanted it to last forever. While he's lost in thought, Jaw walks up and informs him that the rest of the tribe is ready to rest for the night. Raycrack is surprised she was able to find him since he didn't tell anyone where he'd be, so she explains that she simply looked around for his fur coat since he's the only one who has one. When he wonders why she gave him in the first place, she says that as the chief of the tribe, she wanted him to have a unique symbol. That word strikes a chord with Raycrack as he stays up all night, still trying to figure out the gold tablet. Suddenly, he notices some insects forming characters in the air and wonders if it's an illusion. When he notices that the symbols resemble the markings on the tablet, he realizes that the thing that needs to be incorruptible isn't the tablet itself but what's on it. So Raycrack grabs a stick and starts writing in the sand. The next morning, Raycrack visits Joel's tent and tells her he's got something to show her. They head back to the spot he was on last night, and he draws a character in the sand that's a symbol for a male lizard man. Next, he draws a similar symbol which Joel correctly guesses is the symbol for a female lizard man. Lastly, he draws another sign between them, and when Joel asks what that one means, he explains that it says they're each other's companions. Then he smoothly adds that it's his answer to the proposal she made the other day. Joel asks if he really understands what this means. So they sit together and hold tails as he assures them that he completely understands what it means. After this, Nebulo receives a notification saying the tribe has discovered written language. He's glad about the development and even though it'll take generations to transform into a modern language, he's glad it's coming this early in the stages. As he continues to watch his lizardmen thrive, he sees Raycrack preparing for an event. He hunts down a massive deer to present to his fiance, which is how weddings are done among the lizardmen. His men cheer him on as he presents the kill to Joel who fist pumps her new man, but just then a sound goes off and Joel goes to untie the trap she set for her game, which is honestly more impressive. Damn. Later, Raycrack meets with the orc chief and says he and his people can continue to live on the land since it was theirs to begin with. The orc chief almost cries rivers as he thanks Raycrack for being so kind. He then introduces his son who knows the area better than anyone and should be able to guide them to a suitable home. He informs them that some tribes in the area are even larger than their own, but with his son leading the way, they have nothing to worry about. The orc chief swears to never forget his kindness and they part ways. Later, one of Raycrack's men discovers some strange prints so Raycrack consults Stargazer to ask what species they belong to. Stargazer says it's probably frogmen who could be evil or good, but they can also communicate like them. 
Judging from the tracks, it seems there were at least five of them, and they seem to be bigger than Lizardmen too. Raycrack suggests they head back to their temporary camp, which is now full of fire and neatly organized leaf houses. Raycrack instructs the men to focus on building way more houses to make the enemy think their numbers are bigger than they actually are. Joel also suggests they'll need more scouts and guards, so Raycrack offers to find some and makes sure everyone shares the work equally. They both figure that those frogmen are already keeping an eye on them. After some days of living there, they still hadn't run into any frogmen. Things were going great. Livestock farming was doing well, and their houses had developed rapidly to adapt to the environment. Their written language had also evolved, and now primitive maps were being created too. Raycrack even made each of them record their daily contribution to the day's harvest, making them compare their output with the rest of the team and enhance productivity. Nebula is proud of their progress and elsewhere. His swarm of locusts are also expanding across the continent. His following has already reached level 4, which is a feat other players could probably only dream of, but since he started at the literal edge of the world, he had some advantage. Raycrack and the rest of his people are now above average for this stage of the game, but the crisis approaching them now is the most dangerous they've ever faced. At that moment, one of his men comes running and announces that the frogmen are finally moving. Raycrack and his men go out to meet them, and they finally come face to face with their possible enemies, but Raycrack is surprised to see a fellow lizardman with them, making him wonder if they're on good terms. One of the frogs introduces himself as Shunin, son of the chief frogman, and explains that they have no intentions of fighting them. Raycrack returns the gesture and introduces himself too, stating they don't intend to take up arms either. He then asks what brings them there so Shunin claims that they're trespassing on their territory, and they've come to inform them of that fact. However, Raycrack insists that the entirety of these lands can't possibly belong to them, and when they arrived, there were no such territory markings, so they couldn't possibly have known it was a part of their land. Shunin apologizes for the oversight, but before he can get any words in, Raycrack says that they've come from a far place and only wish to rest there. Shunin struggles to find the words to reply while Raycrack remains confident and butters him up, by saying that he must surely be someone qualified to allow them grace. The idiot frog falls for the flattery and immediately permits it, since he's the heir of the chieftaincy. However, he can feel the piercing stares of the buff guards right behind him. Raycrack knows that they're merely guards and can't overrule Shunin, even if he's a stain on his gene pool. Raycrack looks toward Owen, who appears to be smiling and has a ton of questions, but he realizes he's got to be smart with asking them. Raycrack suggests they head back to his village so they can be treated appropriately, and since there has been no conflict so far, they should celebrate that. Shunin thanks him for the offer but refuses it, since they've not built up enough mutual trust yet. Raycrack insists that they can't just let the people who've shown them such favor leave without anything, so he asks if they're down to stay right there and share some food. This time, even the guards are starving, and they allow Shunin to agree. Moments later, Adir is being roasted on fire while Raycrack and Shuman sit to talk. Raycrack thinks of a way to figure out what that lizard man is doing with the frog folk and what their real intentions are without letting them get suspicious. Raycrack asks what the bright feathers around Shunin's neck are, so Shunin explains their feathers of a cockatrice, which are large, dangerous birds that live around there in the forest. When Raycrack hears that they're venomous and notoriously hard to catch too, he asks if they use javelins to hunt them but this surprises Shuman. He calls out for someone to bring over a bow and arrow, and Raycrack wonders what in the world he's talking about. Shunin kindly tells Owen to get the equipment and after handing them over, Owen asks if he wouldn't mind setting up a wooden plank for him to practice with. When it's all set up, Shunin takes a shot and it lands right at the middle, impressing Raycrack. Shunin explains that they all learn to shoot from a young age, and he's actually one of the best shots in the tribe, so Raycrack commends him and asks if he can take a shot at it. Shunin hands it over and warns him it'll be hard at the start, while Raycrack gets a feel for the weapon and compares it to the javelins they use. He tries his first shot, but it lands short of the plank, so he tries again and again, tempted to take one home with him. Once Raycrack runs out of arrows, Shunin asks Owen why he's not picking up the arrows, so Owen quickly hurries to get them. Raycrack offers to join him since he shot the arrows so Shunin tells him to do as he pleases. When Raycrack approaches Owen, he seems to be panicking, but when he asks why he's with the frogmen, he simply says they live in the same village. 
When Redcrack asks why that is, Owen says they help each other out and tries to keep the smile on his face as wide as possible. Raycrack probes further and Owen says that the frogmen protect them while they pick fruits for them but Raycrack doesn't understand why they can't protect themselves. Owen insists that the forest is dangerous and the frogmen have the largest tribe so they need them to survive. Lartak tells him to forget their conversation and say he was asking about archery if they ask. Later, the lizardmen serve up some meat for Schumann, who's excited as he's never had it with seasoning before. Raycrack asks if he's ever tried buffalo meat before and Schumann says he'd tried it once before and it was tasty. Raycrack brags that they've got live buffaloes in his village and offers to trade him a few for some bows and arrows, so Schumann immediately agrees till he notices the disapproving frog behind him and changes his mind. Schumann says they can revisit the matter once they've gotten to know each other better then points out how well his people get along with Lizardmen. He calls out for Owen to back him up, and Owen starts rehearsing one bold speech while Raycrack notes that it's almost like they prepared this show in advance. If he hadn't talked with Owen earlier, he might even have believed the face he's making now. Afterwards, they wrap up their meeting and when Raycrack suggests they come all the way to their village next time, Schumann insists that the current spot is more suitable. Both sides wave goodbye, and just as the frogmen turn to leave, Schumann puts his arm on Owen which causes him to cower in fear. Raycrack and Joel catch the look and conclude that it sure didn't look like a good relationship. Back at the frog village, Schumann slaps Owen and demands to know what he discussed with the lizard chief. Owen insists that he didn't reveal anything as Raycrack was simply asking how to be a better bowman. The guard kicks him in the gut and tells him that's a dumb excuse since he can't even shoot a bow. But Owen explains that it would have been suspicious if he couldn't shoot. Schumann sees his point and Owen continues by saying he had told Raycrack he'd need to pay to learn, but he walked away since he didn't have anything valuable on him. Schumann buys his story for now, but he reminds him of what's on the island and calls him a lucky man. His son was scheduled to be sacrificed, but now new sacrifices have shown up, so Owen agrees and promises to help them fool the lizardmen. That night, Owen sits alone, regretting ever traveling to this region and trusting their tribe even though they were conflicting races. From there, they were deceived into going to the island and partaking in some phony ritual. Now the 200 of them that are left stand zero chance against 1,500 frogmen, but the worst part of all is that they have a god, a two-headed viker who rules over them and feeds on the rest of the lizardmen. Owen remembers Raycrack and thinks he's a pretty strong warrior, but he only has 600 men at most, and there's still savages who don't even know how to use a bow and arrow. Owen figures that if they're sacrificed first, his people get to live longer, so he plans that for his son's sake, they'll lure all the lizardmen to the frog village. A few days later, Raycrack meets Shunin with a live buffalo and offers to trade the beast for a bow again. Shunin hesitates, so Owen takes the lead and says they should get to know each other a bit better first and asks if they'd take them on a tour of their village first. Some days later, Raycrack and Joel test out their version of the bow, but they conclude that the frogmen's bows still make their arrows fly faster. Raycrack stares at their version and wonders what creature's tendons are used to the bowstring, which seems to be the only thing they can't get right. Jal reminds Raycrack that their fifth meeting with the frogs is coming up, and they seem to be desperate to find out more about them. Raycrack knows that they're definitely hiding something under their fake friendship, but since they can't figure it out, they'll need to keep their guard up. Further, they need to give them something big enough in exchange for one of their bows, so they should pack up as many herbs that can cure their itchiness as possible. Lastly, Raycrack hopes that Owen will be the key to their success, so Jal suggests they simply talk to him and give him a chance to earn their trust. Meanwhile, in the frog village, the guard called Oh Boy almost squeezes the life out of Owen as he demands to know why it's taking so long to get the lizardmen to the village. Shunin tells Oh Boy to ease up on the torture tactics and let the lizard speak. Owen explains that Raycrack is more cautious than he thought, unlike his foolish that would have taken candy from a clown in a sewer. Oh boy tosses the fool aside and leaves him to Shounen. In a haunting tone, Schumann tells Owen that he'd better hurry as his father has chosen to move up the live sacrifice ceremony. He needs to get as much information out of the lizards and lure them to the village before it's too late. Owen asks why the sacrifice is being moved up, half expecting Schumann to be tight-lipped about it, but to his surprise, Schumann reveals that his father and the elders are getting sicker. Owen wonders how an itchy sickness can be so dangerous and though Shimon hesitates to spill the beans, he figures, since it's just Owen, it'll be fine. 
While that disease doesn't just itch, it also causes a sticky white mucus to cover their body. The itchiness in the mucus never go away so at some point it becomes hard to breathe, and then you just croak. Even the priests have started dying from it so it's pretty serious. Om assumes Shunin is trying to test him with the information, so he suggests that the story mustn't be spread among the lizardmen or they'll start thinking the frogmen are weak. He then suggests that even if the story spreads, they can claim the disease can also spread to lizardmen. Schumann commends the brilliant idea and Owen goes further to say they can crush some nearby plants and pretend that it's mucus to really sell the story. Since Owen is in contact with a lot of frogmen, he can pretend he's gotten the disease first. Schumann praises him again and calls him quite the bargainer. Then he returns to his shady tone and suggests that if Owen can get the lizardman to the village in time, he can exclude his son from the sacrifice. Owen thanks him for the offer, but Schumann says he'll still have to talk to a boy about it. Before Shunin leaves, Owen asks for one more thing, some bows and arrows to make the negotiations smoother. A few days later, the lizardmen and the frogmen meet again, with Raycrack and Shunin sitting to discuss as usual. Yuri tries to sell Shunin on a metal board, but Shunin remains unimpressed since it's too hard to process. Raycrack presents a ton of herbs for the itchiness and asks if it's still not enough for some bows, but Shunin claims that trading weapons is too complicated to do without a show of faith. Raycrack calls out this consistent talk of faith, then he asks for a favor since their tribes are such good friends now. He asks to speak with Owen in private, so Schumann gladly tells him to go ahead, while Owen continues to smile ominously. When the two lizardmen are alone, Owen cooks up this bullshit story about the brotherly ritual they performed with the frogmen before joining their tribe. Then he offers to tell more about the frogmen if Raycrack also tells him more about their tribe, encouraging him to trust him. However, Raycrack sees that glowing butterfly again, and when it lands right on Owen, he knows exactly what to do and offers to tell Owen everything. After that meeting, Owen reports to Shunin and Oboy, who commend him for getting a lot in exchange for some measly bow. And what's more, the left-brained lizardman had apparently offered to come to the village themselves. Oboy adds that he thought it was a trap when the lizardman offered to let them tour their village. But it turns out that the lizards are just dumb. After that tour, they know exactly where they are and the number of warriors they have, and contrary to the scout's report of 600 members, they actually only have half of that, with only 30 being warriors. Schumann commends Owen on a job well done and asks him what he wants as a reward, but Owen says he only needs what Schumann promised him the other day. Schumann suddenly develops amnesia, so Owen reminds his clearly expiring brain of his promise to free his son. Oh boy is just about to get on Shunin's ass about it, but Shunin tells him his father will definitely understand as they need to set an example that good things will come if the lizardmen obey them. Shunin assures Owen he'll remember his promise and Omen thanks him profusely. That evening, Owen returns to his usual spot across the island glad that he'll finally get to live with his son, but he can't help but wonder why that foolish lizard chief would trust him. During their last meeting, Raycrack had shown Owen the letters they had created in their village. He showed him different ones including the characters for No and Lies. Intrigued, Owen even suggested they could put two characters together. For instance, the last two characters together would be Not a Lie, which means truth. Raycrack praises him for being smart and Owen indeed knows that he is. That's why they call him the Bargainer. But now that Owen thinks about it, Raycrack never mentioned the letters to the frogman. So why does he get to know? Raycrack explains that even though he's been talking about building faith with the frogman all this time, the faith he really wants to build is with Owen. Owen gets nervous as he struggles with what to say but Raycrack cuts to the chase and says he doesn't believe a word Owen has been saying before this. Raycrack and his people have known pain and they can tell the difference between prey and predator, and when he looks at Owen, he sure sees a bottom boy. When Raycrack asked if he was right, Owen said he wasn't and continued to keep up the act, but Raycrack had gotten everything he needed. Now Owen continues to wonder why Raycrack was so confident even though there's no way they can beat the frogmen in their bows. Owen continues to think it over, remembering the creature they claim to capture without proof and the fact that their weapons suck. Owen decides he isn't worthy of their trust, and as he stands up from what he's been writing, he concludes that he's just a bargainer. The next morning, the frogmen rush out excitedly as the lizardmen have finally arrived. Shunin welcomes them, and Raycrack thanks him for the hospitality. He then apologizes for the weapons they brought, explaining that they were concerned they might encounter a cockatrice along the way so Schumann says he understands as he plots to get them all drunk and poisoned when the feast begins. 
Raycrack asks where Owen is so Schumann says he's preparing for the feast and calls out for him, noticing that he seems to be writing something on the floor. Schumann says they can go over to meet Owen while he goes to check on the food. Raycrack goes over to meet Owen who tells him that they're see to the places where he wrote those letters. Owen continues to say the banquet will be one of friendship and peace, but when Raycrack looks down on the floor, he sees that Owen has written the character for lies over and over again. Raycrack calls out to Yuri, lowers his skull, and tells him it's time to begin. Yuri obeys the order and immediately hurls a spear right at one of the frogmen. Raycrack gives the order to take out all of the frogmen and his men continue to attack, while the frogmen wail about Owen being a traitor. After they finish clearing that area, Yuri reports that some of the other frogmen, including Shunin, fled during their first attack, so they should be expecting a fight with their bowmen soon. Thankfully, they have a backup plan for that too. So Raycrack turns to Owen and tells him there's something he needs him to do. Meanwhile, Shounen and the Bauman prepare for battle as Shunin wonders what the Owen must have done to cause this. Shunin tells one of his men to get Oboi to rally the other warriors so they can attack at once while they send the rest of their lizardmen to hold them off. Shunin plans to reduce their numbers till reinforcements arrive and orders his men to fire their arrows which are laced with a special frog poison that would cause its victims to die in agony. However, the lizardmen came prepared and under Yuri's instructions, they lifted up their shields which easily deflects all the arrows. Shuman suddenly has the urge to sh** as he realizes their attack was a complete bust. Meanwhile, Yuri's enjoying himself as he brags to Raycrack about how he knew those metal boards would come in handy. Shuman tells his bowman to wait until the lizardmen start moving toward them when suddenly, smoke starts filling the air. Thanks to the smoke, the frogmen can't see the lizardmen from afar anymore which means their shots will be less accurate, so Schumann wonders how the hell they pulled this off. Within the village, Owen begins to set everything on fire, while the other neutered lizardmen ask why he's doing this. Owen asks what they hope to do with such pathetic weapons, so they weakly explain what Schumann ordered them to do and ask if he's also doing the same. However, Owen says he's following Raycrack's orders and asks them to trust him, while the lizardmen crush the frogmen. The lizards ask how on earth they're supposed to trust him after getting them into this mess in the first place, but Owen assures them that he's risking everything for this. The others see his determination, so they light their weapons to help spread the fire. Shunin stares in disbelief as he finally realizes it was Owen that caused the fire, so he tells his men to retreat for now as they're outnumbered. The frogmen refuse as they remind him that their fellow warriors are dead, but Shunin reminds them that if the hero of the chieftain see meets his end here, the tribe is finished. The frogmen reluctantly agree, thinking they're about to join up with Oboi and the other warriors but Shunin knows that they'll need a being way stronger than Oboi to get rid of them. Meanwhile, on the other side of the village, Oboi gets word that Shunin is retreating like a spineless coward. Oboi figures that all the men at the banquet must have died, but counting the men with Shunin, the men with him, and the ones on the online, they should be around 45 warriors left, which means they're still at an advantage. Oboi pulls out a poisonous frog and tells his men to douse their arrows in its mucus and get ready to move after Shunin arrives. Suddenly, Oboi hears large footsteps approaching, so he tells his men to prepare to shoot, but he suddenly gets hit with this overwhelming tension. It's almost like when he faced that cockatrice the other day which means it's something dangerous. Suddenly, a shadowy figure appears behind the tree line with glowing red eyes. The frogmen shoot their arrows instantly, but it's no use. The beast, which turns out to be good old Manon, just catches the arrow in his mouth while the others bounce right off him. Jal speaks fondly to Manon, saying he's much bigger than the last time she rode him, while the lizard beside her asks if Manon just got hit. Jal explains that Manon simply ate the arrow since he eats everything that comes near his mouth. She then tells Manon to look at the delicious, all-you-can-eat buffet he's having for dinner. The frogmen begin to panic as they realize their arrows aren't working so a boy considers going for its eye, but he knows Manon's too fast for him to get a clean shot. Manon charges straight for them and Oboi dodges out of the way, leaving his frogman brothers as the appetizer. He then thinks of a way to get the poison in and realizes he can just throw the frog in its mouth. When he sees Manon gladly eating the frog, he tells his men to throw all their frogs in there since the creature doesn't know it's poisonous. Manon gladly catches his early dessert, while the lizardmen wonder why they're throwing Manon snacks since it won't bribe him. It turns out that the Lizardman tribe has the blessings of hard scales, beetle strength, and toxin resistance. It finally dawns on Oboi how deep in he's in as Manon stares down at him, ready for the main course. 
Manon goes for the head and takes Oboy out. Meanwhile, on the other side of the village, Raycrack watches as the houses burn when a frogman sneaks up behind him and takes a shot. Raycrack looks unbothered as he watches a javelin take the arrow out, and it turns out to be Yuri, who informs him that the guy he just offed was the last warrior. A figure Shuman must have abandoned his village since they see the captured lizardman attacking the frogman too. What's really strange is that despite how bad things have gotten, the real frogman chief has yet to show his ugly face. Well, that's all thanks to Nebula, who's been working behind the scenes. Nebula had access to a disease that only affected amphibians through their mucous membranes. It was tricky to find, but by the time Raycrack had decided to leave the oasis, he had finally found the disease. Using transporting insects, he took part of the infected frog and brought it all the way to the lake thanks to his insect summoning ability. After his insect assassins did their job, the chief of the tribe just seemed to disappear. The chief was a fanatic who sacrificed innocent lives just to cure his illness, but was no use. Even at this moment, while his village burned, the chief was once again calling on his two-headed god to feast on the sacrifices they had prepared this time. As the two-headed serpent started rising from the water, the chief begged it to take out all the lizardmen, and when Shunin saw that his father had started the ritual, he truly believed they had finally won. Meanwhile, Owen desperately runs up to Raycrack, who commends him on his work so far but asks why he's trying to break into the speed force. Owen tells them they need to get to the island because some lizardmen children are about to be sacrificed to the frogman god. Raycrack scolds him for not telling him earlier, saying the boats have already sailed away, and it would be too dangerous to swim, since they have bows they can use on them. Owen begs desperately as he reveals that his son is part of the sacrifice, so Raycrack shoots him a piercing look and slaps the out of Owen, screaming that he should have told them earlier and trusted him sooner. Owen holds his grief-stricken face as Raycrack says that they'll defeat the remaining frogmen and if their BS god shows up, they'll show them what a real god looks like. Raycrack calms down and says that he should have spoken up sooner to save his son's life and laments that things could have gone much differently if he had just spoken up sooner. At that moment, the two-headed serpent rises from the lake as the chief points to the sacrifices they prepared and tells him to punish all the lizardmen in return. As Owen watches the serpent from afar, he desperately wishes he wasn't too late. Raycrack sees that it's bigger than the Coleoptera, and they don't have any advantage this time so they can't cheat. However, at that moment, he sees the blue butterfly, so he tells Owen to look up and asks if he believes in miracles. Well, standing before them was one big bug-eyed creature, but it was on their side. Back on the island, the chief continued his ritual to the giant serpent, when he suddenly noticed the serpent was no longer focusing on the sacrifice, which was a first. When the chief turned to look, it saw the bug-like monstrosity behind him and was scandalous. The two monsters came face to face while the frogmen cowered in fear, thinking another god had shown up. However, it wasn't a god, it was Nebula's creation formed from his divinity level and abomination essence. He was sure not many other players would have their own creatures, especially one as badass as this. The creature restrains the two-headed serpent, and the frogmen start to run for it, leaving the lizard children in the battle zone of two monsters. Shunin tries to get his dad to run, but the idiot fanatic keeps insisting that the two-headed god would win the monster rumble. Well, he spoke too soon and the bug slices through the overgrown worm, as it expresses its disgust for the fake god. Just like Nebula had said, the creature was sentient and was hell-bent on offering the puny god to his creator. The mantisoid thoughtfully prayed for the serpent's sin to be forgiven as he ripped it in half graciously. The two-headed serpent never stood a chance with strength at 163, going up against Stratus with 220 strength points. The lizardmen rejoiced at their win while Owen cried in relief. As Nebula watched from the skies, he realizes the serpent wasn't as strong as it looked since it couldn't use its phylum. Its essence floated from its carcass, and Nebula received a notification that he had acquired its essence. However, its phylum was unknown so Nebula hoped that his luck would give him a good phylum, but when he unlocked it, he discovered it was the Ocean Phylum. Ocean isn't a bad phylum, but it isn't something he can use at the moment so he figures it'll come in handy someday. Meanwhile, the frogmen escape the island on boats as the chief continues to wonder how his worm god failed. Shunin gave his father the side eye as he realized that the itchy disease isn't what made him weak, it was that damn god. When it arrived, they all thought they would be safe forever, so their warriors stopped training and became cowards. Meanwhile, Nebula tells Stratus he can rest until the next time he's needed. 
and as Stratus vanishes, he says he'd gladly serve him again. Nebula leaves the scene to Raycrack, who's sure to clean out the trash. When Raycrack sees the frogmen retreating to their upper village, Raycrack asks for volunteers to swim to the island with him. Owen's the first to offer for obvious reasons, but the rest of the lizardmen also offer to help in any way they can. Raycrack reminds them they're not exactly warriors at this point, but the men insist that they don't need to be to take down the frogmen. They already took down some civilians when they watched Raycrack and his men fighting, and it reminded them of what they had been feeling since the day they were captured. As tears flow down his face, he says they need an outlet for the anger they've kept in for the loss of their brethren, children, and grandchildren. So Raycrack leads the charge and tells them to follow him to seek their vengeance. Raycrack remembers when Shuman had given him shooting lessons, but bragged that he was still not as good as his frogmen warriors. Shuman explained that even though he hit the bullseye, he took too long to shoot his arrow. This confused Raycrack since he thought the whole point was to inflict critical damage on his target. But Schumann explained that his target would likely be moving, and it would be better to slow it down first. Raycrack promised to keep that in mind as Shunin assured him he'd also learn how to make a bow soon since even lizardmen can get the right materials. Raycrack remembers there being something ominous about Shunin's statement, so as he swims to the island, he intends to get some answers. Onan finally reunites with his son and sheds tears while hugging him close so Raycrack tells Yuri to take the kids and exhausted lizardmen back on some boats and then take the grey lizardmen to the back of the village. Yuri realizes he plans to attack from both sides and Raycrack says they'll be okay, since they've gotten another blessing from God. Their black scales will look like ripples under the moonlight. Back in the village, the frogmen go into a panic when they see the lizardmen appear out of nowhere. As the lizards take out all the frogmen, their chief still foolishly calls out for the two-headed serpent to save him, but Raycrack shuts his ass up with a spear to the head as he reminds him that his god is gone. Meanwhile, while the rest of his brothers make their last croak, Shunan hides behind a treehouse, wondering how it all went wrong. He continues to lament that his father let the warriors slack off, and combined with the lizardmen's immunity to poison, they were toast. Suddenly, everything goes quiet, and just when Shunan wonders if the lizardmen have left, a voice from behind him calls out his hiding place. Shunan screams as he comes face to face with Raycrack, who tells him to try and save his last shred of dignity by raising his weapon. Shunan refuses and begs him to save him instead, reminding him about the times they spent together and claiming that they were threatened by their god. When that doesn't work, Shunan holds up his bow and offers to tell him the secret to getting the perfect bowstring. Raycrack tells him to go ahead so Shunan happily reveals that it's the tendons of a living being. Raycrack stares him down intensely and asks what race they're from, and just like his foolish father, he stammers as he reveals they're from Lizardmen. Shunan knows he's pretty much begging to be shish kabod, but Raycrack lifts the curtain and tells him he's free to go since he's won a complete victory already. Raycrack doesn't stutter as he tells the frog to get going, so Shunan starts running as fast as he can while Owen asks if he's really letting him go. Raycrack draws his bow and says yes since he needs a moving target. Some days later, Raycrack uses one of the dead frogmen as target practice, while Owen shows up in a frog skull and says the bows are now similar to the ones the frogs used. Raycrack says he's not sure about that, since the new bowstring material tends to snap when he pulls it at a certain point. Unfortunately, there aren't any stronger materials in the area, and it seems like they can't stay there forever anyway since winter is coming. To feed their buffaloes, they'll need to move to a warmer place. Raycrack asks Owen if he went hunting again, and Owen responds by revealing they've exterminated all the remaining frogmen in the area, so they won't be running out of bowstring material for quite a while. Raycrack tells him that's good to hear as he remembers Shunin's last moments. Just like he taught him, Raycrack shot him in the legs to stop him from moving, and then a mob of angry lizardmen showed up led by Owen and took care of the rest. Owen asks if Raycrack is still after the frog chief, but Raycrack says his skull is probably on someone's head, just like Shunin is on Owen's. Next, Owen tries to inform him of something they discovered, when Jal notices a kid eavesdropping on their conversation. The kid panics and drops a sculpture, which catches Jal's attention as it looks just like Stratus. Jal shows Raycrack the sculpture, who seems rather impressed and compliments the kid on doing a good job. The child says he wants Raycrack to have it, and when Raycrack looks hesitant, Owen explains that it's common among the kids to give out figurines. The kid explains that all the kids have them because their guardian was an amazing being who saved them. 
Raycrack says it would be nice if everyone had one so the kids promise to check the village for more while Raycrack encourages him to sell it. Afterward, he asks Owen what he was trying to say earlier, and Owen says they found something strange in a cave where some frogmen were hiding. Later, Owen leads Raycrack and Jaw to the mysterious cave, saying they already eliminated all the frogs that were inside. Raycrack's eyes widen as he sees a large structure with strange markings on it. Raycrack wonders how such a hard stone was carved with such precision and notes that it looks similar to the pattern on the back of the beetle. Nebula also wonders what the lizardmen have stumbled on and thinks it might be an ancient ruin. One can gain knowledge or discover treasure in some ruins, but some ruins are of a demonic nature. Nebula thinks that since their era is still in primitive stages, obtaining ancient knowledge doesn't really matter while ruins that can grant special blessings are tied to specific locations, making them useless to nomadic lizards. Nebula watches as Raycrack begins to unseal the cave and figures it'll be fine as long as it doesn't have a demonic nature. However, when the seal is removed, a creature down in the depths of the cave senses that someone has finally entered the demonic world. Raycrack and his men head inside and notice how deep it is, though it would be a pain to have to walk down all those stairs. Jowl asks Raycrack if he intends to ask for God's blessing to jump down but Raycrack says it's too trivial to bother God for. Suddenly, they hear a sound nearby, and several red-eyed rats start to emerge from the darkness looking off. Raycrack wonders what substance those rats have been sniffing to be sounding like that while Joel tells them he's eaten their kind before. Raycrack remembers but states that these are bigger, move in a large group, and are more aggressive. Owen agrees and they conclude they're just monster rats at this point. Raycrack gets a hunch that they may be protecting the place so he tells them to ready their weapons, which causes them to attack. The lizardmen stab them down and Raycrack points out how suspicious their behavior is. They wonder what to do with them so Raycrack suggests they cut them open, while Joel wonders if they can tame and raise them like the buffaloes. Owen interrupts and suggests raising fish since they're pretty difficult to catch during hatching season. Raycrack thinks about it and Owen adds that they could build a dam to trap them in during hatching season. Suddenly, a zapping sound comes from behind as one of the lizards yells out in pain that the rat bastard is still alive. Raycrack asks it a bit his hand, but the lizard says that as it was trying to cut it open, it went pest and his hand started to hurt. Curious, Raycrack decided to try it himself and also got shot real bad, so Jaw screams out for him, but he assures the missus that he's fine. Nebula sees a notification showing the rats are covered in demonic energy that grants them electricity abilities. Raycrack was hoping it wouldn't be a demonic ruin, but electricity is actually one of the weaker abilities among the demonic ruins. However, if Raycrack manages to reach the end of the ruin, he will gain demonic power. He wouldn't become a mage right away, but future generations would probably produce mages. The real problem is that in perished world, magic and divine power tend to conflict because the source of magic is said to be an ancient evil. High-level mages tend to not rely on gods and just make their own forces and as people get influenced by them, they lose their faith in God. There is a way to overcome this, but it would be risky and complicated at this stage of the game, but in any case, the demonic ruin would soon show its intentions and try to draw them in. Just as Nebula said, Raycrack watches as a strange luminous being flies around the ruin and asks if he wants its power. Jowl suggests they can leave if he's not feeling well, but Raycrack insists that he's fine and orders his men to make sure the rats are dead this time. Raycrack realizes he's the only one who can see the flying creature and wonders what it is. The creature responds to his thoughts and says he's the spirit guarding the ruin and only powerful people can see him. Raycrack asks what he meant by giving him power, but he notices he can keep his true intentions, hidden even though the spirit can read his thoughts. Nebula sees the demon spirit is up to no good and wonders if he should warn Raycrack when he notices something strange. On Raycrack's stats, he appears to have acquired the skill of deception. Nebula figures he must have gotten it while facing Shunin's deception, so he decides to leave the situation to Raycrack to figure out. The demonic spirit tells Raycrack that his power is called lightning, which can burn down enemies with a heat like fire, and he can give the power to him on one condition. Raycrack says he never mentioned a condition before, so the spirit says it's not hard to fulfill and Raycrack can easily do it with his strength. However, Raycrack tells the spirit to come straight next time and tell him that he wants something. He tells Pist that he should state his conditions and tell him exactly what he wants, but if he tries to hide anything again, that would be the end of their conversation.
Will Redcrack forsake his god to have power of his own? Comment Perished World if you want to find out in our part 2. Leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and subscribe to the channel for similar content. And as always, thanks for watching.